Hi, I'm Cash, and this is the Micro Business Renegade Podcast, a weekly podcast about our business startup recollections to help you start thinking about and running your own micro businesses. Our recollections, micro business advice, and content is strictly our own personal opinions. All right, now it's time for our business update. Okay, so for the BNB, we're adding an extra bed to the BNB in the trout room due to excess demand. A lot of companies have put their workers on a waiting list for accommodations. So we have a list that's about two pages long now. (laughs) Ha ha ha, hot diggity dog. Well, our final inspection hasn't happened yet, and it might not happen until spring for the hot dog cart. We had an $800 PST issue. Shipping across Canada does not work that well due to the fact that every province has different provincial taxes that have to be paid on goods and services. Also, we need to start a blog for Mr. and Mrs. Hot Dog web page pretty soon just to raise our SEO. SEO is Search Engine Optimization for when we start looking for events here in the spring. Well, for the music lessons, there's nothing new to report. It's all pretty good. All the open spaces are now filled thanks to posting in neighborhood Facebook groups. And uh, Cash is getting into the Christmas music with his students, aren't you? Oh, yeah. It's going swell. We're jingle jangling all the way. And another new thing is we launch podcast episode two to you great folks at home. We have made some marketing decisions and need to put some more visuals on our web page and probably experiment with a little bit of paid social media advertising. We will be doing some guerrilla marketing using our podcast posters and some podcast stickers around the university in Kamloops, focusing on the local level. We joined some community groups by posting our podcasts in ads and news groups locally and in large cities around the world. We paid for a Facebook ad and a week-long campaign. It worked for our B&B, but I'm uh, not too sure if it worked for the podcast. I'm really hesitant to spend money on a podcast, so we kept our budget to 100 clams, which, in the scheme of things, is a tiny amount because some people spend thousands of bones. But I find the barometrics for measuring success on Facebook ad campaigns super confusing, so I don't like spending my bread there. We spent time on Twitter, as it seemed a lot of the other podcasters were there as well. Ah, We made some great friends. Some of them even shared our podcast around. And thank you, Ronnie and Bo Show. You guys are awesomely excellent. Thank you for uh, mentioning a shout-out to our micro-business renegade. And we'll definitely be sharing around the Ronnie and Bo Show any chance we get. Uh, especially, I'd like to give a shout out to the Ronnie and Bo podcast show. Oh, yeah. And Mike Me Audio, Audio, because Mike Me Audio sent me a little critique of what we were doing, so I found that really useful. Oh, yeah. yeah. His name is Nick, so thanks, Nick. And Ronnie and Bo, wow, they're hilarious. They have a show down <laughs> in uh, Arizona. Oh, yeah. So we were communicating back and forth a little bit. The Ronnie and Bo show. Yeah, so, so I, check it out. I just love that. I was, I was just listening to that, and I wanted to give a shout out there to the old Nick too, because, you know, his critique was spot on. You know, Journey. Yeah, I know. It was nice to get some feedback from somebody. So yeah, I'm really liking Twitter right now. There's lots of people out there, and they have lots to say, and they're sending us comments back. Oh, so yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. Hey kids, we're going to talk about some marketing today. How do you market a micro-business? That's right. Marketing is one of the most important tasks for any business. How do you reach your customers? Hmm. How do you do it Mm cost-effectively? Well, by golly, you shouldn't wait to start thinking about your marketing. You need to start planning out what you're going to be doing before you start your micro-business. Absolutely, Cash. We have some marketing questions that you need to ask yourself before you even open your doors. That's right. So, the first question you need to ask yourself is, where is your HQ located? Ah, your headquarters. For us, the Micro Business Renegade headquarters has always been from our home. We like the fact that we don't have to pay an expensive lease, and we like making our house sweat. 
What I mean by sweating is at this moment our house is doing triple duty as a home office for three and possibly four businesses. Our house is also one of our businesses, the B&B, and it's also a place where we live. We live down in the dungeon, below the B&B. <laughs> You know, Journey, we've always made our places sweat. You remember that place in Vancouver we had? A little blue house on the corner. I mean, talk about making it sweat. Like, we don't have time to go into it right now, but we had businesses coming and going and renters. And, you know, we live there too. And, you know, if you're paying a mortgage and property tax and on and on it goes, you know, you might as well make your house sweat. I totally agree with you. I think that um, just living in a house is a waste of money. I would never buy a house again and just live there. There has to be some income coming in from the house to make it worth it. I agree. And, you know, the way the, the old world's going down, the old crapper, environmental and all this other stuff that's going on. I mean, if you're just living in a house and uh, got all this vacated space, you're really not even doing well for the mother nature footprint you know i want to make mother nature happy i want mother nature to give me a a big wave from the other side you know that's true if you got the space you might as well use it so we're making our house sweat i can't even tell you how much money that is saving us and going back to proximity the closer you are in physical proximity to your target market the less money you have to pay out for marketing for example Airbnb is 10 minutes away from the largest copper mine in the world, which is going through a major expansion. All the mine workers want to stay with us. That's right. Cha-ching. And because they know where we are, we are operating strictly by word of mouth marketing at the moment, which is free. So that's saving us a lot of money too. We did use a little bit of SEO by blogging our Facebook and web page to get our web page to the top of Google at first, and that helped us out a little bit. But, you know, word of mouth is definitely better than any technology you could ever do. I agree, Journey. Straight from the horse's mouth is where it's at. <laughs> if you're in a larger city, you will have more competition for the best locations and customers for your business. We moved to a small town on purpose to cut costs and to be a service that was unique and needed in the community. Okay, Cash. So the second and third questions go together. You need to ask, who is my target market and how do I reach them? So the first question was, where was my HQ? But now you need to ask, who is my target market and how do I reach them? Well, for instance, for my music lessons, my target market is moms and dads with kids. Moms and dads and kids spend a lot of time in their cars driving from activity to activity and after school. They don't spend a lot of time on social media because they're never at home. So all the money I spent on those platforms like Google, AdWords, and Facebook did not work very well. I ended up using Canada Post to mail out brochures so that parents could find the information amongst their other essential mail. We also did a lot of guerrilla advertising, <laughs> putting up posters on super mailboxes, and banner advertising by highways after school so the parents could see us when they drove by on their way to other activities. I also had vinyl lettering and a phone number slapped on my car so parents could see me while I was driving around after school. So, that brings us to our fourth question. How much dough do you have to spend on marketing? It is important to be realistic and to want to spend the least amount of money as possible. We had learned from marketing our music lessons not to overspend as we overspent on our advertising budget with the music lessons and it actually ended up being the death of us down in Vancouver. Yeah, there were so many mistakes made in the big city cash. We spread our marketing net too far and wide from our location. Instead of just advertising in Coquitlam where our HQ was, we advertised all over the lower mainland. And when social media and Google AdWord campaigns didn't work because our target market was never at home, we had to move over to Canada Post and do direct mail with brochures, which is effective, but super expensive. Yeah, I agree, Journey. 
And we also supplemented our paid advertising with guerrilla marketing, and that held us together for a while. But in the end, we were not realistic with our marketing money and used all our profits on advertising to feed the beast. It just wasn't sustainable. When Journey and I moved to a small town, we realized that families here tend to only enroll their kids in a couple activities a week and spend way more time on social media. I posted my information in community groups on Facebook, and I had a full customer base in a couple of days. And it didn't cost me a cent. I remember when you were in Coquitlam, it took months to fill up your customer base. Oh, yeah. It was horrible. <laughs> I agree with you, Journey. I mean, it was harder than fitting an elephant through an eye hole of a needle. I mean, we tried everything. Mm -mm, hot diggity dog. I'm getting hungry here. Me too. Yeah, and you know why? It's those late night cravings. I mean, we're craving our midnight snack. It's the only time that we get to record, as I always say, is at the wee hours in the morning here in front of the glow and the light of the recording light. And um, yeah, I'm getting hungry too, Journey. And one of my favorite snacks is hot dogs. I know. I think I'm going to go boil up some uh, ballparks in a minute. Mm. You know, I kept going on and on about being a sponsorship for us, uh, a coffee sponsorship. That's great and all. And what would also be great is a hot dog sponsorship by, you know, someone. I know, right? Like ballpark? Hey, if you're listening. All right. Well, speaking of hot dogs... We are just starting the marketing for our hot dog vending company, Mr. and Mrs. Hot Dog. We have a web page and tricked out the web address. We'll probably start SEO blogging soon and tagging some photos because Marilyn Monroe is pretty visual and she'll have some beautiful logos on her soon. And as usual here in the studio, she's got my back covered. She's right behind me. In fact, I lean on her stainless steel. Cash, that's kind of creepy. The target market for Mr. and Mrs. Hot Dog Company will be families, and we are already getting calls to do family events even though we are not even in business. We will be setting up here in town and in Kamloops, which is about uh, 25 minutes away. We've had a lot of people ask us if we're going to be selling gourmet hot dogs uh. with extra, you know sauces and gourmet toppings ah, like yeah. uh, jalapenos and, ah, and taco chips and all that, that kind of stuff. Man. But no, I'm telling people right now, the money is in the middle. Huh. Never go high end I on agree. anything. Go straight down the middle. That's where the market is. That's where the money is. Don't spend too much money trying to make your business look like some Hollywood movie star uh, place because the money is just not there. People like to spend the least amount of money as possible, but they still want a quality product. So stay away from high end businesses. It's safe to say we definitely do not have the marketing money that we had for the music lesson companies on the coast. So if social media marketing stops being effective, we will go back to using guerrilla marketing to supplement our advertising. I agree with you, Journey. And now I got to explain what guerrilla marketing is as a definition and also explain some of the ways we've actually used guerrilla marketing. So guerrilla marketing is marketing that's low cost, in your face, and you use your own energy to implement it. So it can be really effective. Yes, I agree, Journey. And some of those ways are highway banner ads, as previously mentioned when I was talking about my music lessons and having a vinyl banner. So I think we need to describe what that is. So when we were doing highway banner ads, that involved a gigantic banner that was about, what, like 10 meters long or so? Yes. And Cash was holding on one end and I was holding the other end of it. And we stood close to highways and we just waved and pointed at our banner and cars drew by and they honked at us and that sort of thing. You remember when that gale force wind came and nearly threw us up like Mary Poppins? How about when we almost got hit by that car? Oh, I loved that when that minivan, she was careening on two wheels and coming right at us. And I said, get the fuck out of the way, Journey. And we both dived. 
Yeah, well, luckily we got out of the way. And I remember there was some negative things to doing that kind of advertising. Um, people threw garbage at us, <laughs> which was definitely not fun. But then there was other people, you know, they'd go by and give us a thumbs up and say, way to go and stuff like that. So that always bolstered our spirits. And the next thing is posters on super boxes. Uh, I mean, super mailboxes, okay? Those those new nifty things that sit all by themselves and you have to walk to them and get your mail because the mailman won't bring it to you. Now, those posters on super mailboxes, uh, they help too because the parents, they go and get their mail and they go and get it. And then below they see your little advertising dingling away in the wind there. And uh, that helps too. That one was super successful. We always got clients from putting posters on mailboxes. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend that one. Yes, I as well. And brochures on windshield wipers in parking lots. Uh, I used to scoot around on my longboard. Remember that journey? Yeah, I do. Yeah, that was nice and fast, and it, it made it a little bit less like work. You know, it's a nice sunny day, blue skies. You know, bring out the old longboard and zip along through the parking lot. So I had it down so good to a science journey that I could actually just cruise on through between cars and just knock them underneath the wiper blades without stopping the, sn without stopping the longboard. Yeah, and I remember it was just that one time the security guard was, was following you around on his little golf cart trying to catch you, <laughs> but... He never did. I kept seeing him go by, but oh, that, he was never able to catch you because you were hiding in between the oh, cart. That was a great one. And I, 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 he was a little bit hefty, you know, and he kind of reminded me of Mall Cop. And he did. <laughs> he had he looked like, like Paul Blart. He, he, had the, he had the stash going on. He was a little bit hefty, you know, and he, uh, he had the Mall Cop outfit. He wasn't a real security. Well, he was a security guard, but he wasn't a police officer and but he, he was a mall cop, and he'd say, he'd shake his fist, you got out of here, and I would just go around the other way and just give the board, a, you know, the, the uh, long board a good, good kick there, and just zip, and up. I'd go the other way, and he'd go on his golf cart the other way. And, I remember, too, that we had walkie-talkies. We were using walkie-talkies for a while because I didn't oh, yeah. have a cell phone. <laughs> oh, so yeah. I kept saying, no. No, he's coming around the other way. You got to go the opposite <laughs> oh, yeah. way. It was totally a covert operation. I'm like, I'm going in, Journey. I'm going in. I'm going down that row. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna fire those brochures. Look then, out! He's coming. And you, you call him all cop. You'd say, Cash, Cash, <laughs> over, over. Is mall cops coming? And I'd go, <laughs> Okay, Journey. Thanks. Over and out. And I'd scoot the other way. So. You know, with that being said, what I'm trying to say here, folks at home, is that you got to make it a little fun. Are you going to go actually kooky? You know, you don't want to end up like me. Okay, and now the next one's a no-brainer, needing no explanation. Put your brochures in shopping carts. The next one's kind of fun, too. Wearing t-shirts at unrelated high-profile events like the p and &E. Pacific National Exhibition, for those that don't know. That's down here in Canada and Vancouver. So, again, wearing T-shirts at unrelated high-profile events such as the P&E. So I remember that one. That was a fun day. We both had T-shirts that had music lessons and a phone number on the T-shirt. Uh, something that we found out after we got in that we weren't allowed to do. Like you're not supposed to do any kind of advertising at these profile events That's unless right. you're paying for it. That's right. So we were running around the PNE and ha again, like having to dodge security, we had to go hide in a bathroom for a while. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I remember when we left, we had a bunch of people following us. So we, we stuck around for a few hours, but eventually they just chased us out. But I think a lot of people saw our shirts. Oh, for sure, Journey. I, it really worked. And we did get calls from that. And the and folks at home, the how we know that these things work is because when we'd get a client or a prospective client saying, hey, I want music lessons or I want this and that from your company, I would say to them, well, how did you find out about us? And then they would say something like, oh, we seen your banner as we drove by or we were at the, uh, we were at the P&E and we seen uh, your name on T-shirts and all this. 
So that's how we know that the marketing, uh, the guerrilla marketing is effective because we'd always ask, how do they find out about our businesses? Now, the next one that's really super duper creative, I think, is lawn chairs on the beach at a high profile family event. So may I explain that one, Journey? Yeah, sure. Okay. Now, what I did is I went to a hardware store. Well, it could be even just a department store, whatever has the best prices on lawn chairs. I found these collapsible, comfy little lawn chairs for $9 each. I bought about 100 of them. Uh, Well, maybe I'm exaggerating. Okay, I bought about 60 of them. I had a budget uh, for advertising. I bought these lawn chairs and I took them back home and I made a like a hard back on them kind of with a coroplast and I used vinyl lettering and I put our web address and advertising on the back of the lawn chairs then later on yeah we took these lawn chairs that we had uh, all decked out with our advertising to a big event in Vancouver it's called the uh, fireworks festival or something like that they have it every year um it's a one trick pony. It's the same thing every year. They're reinventing the wheel kind of thing. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a fun thing for families. And there's hundreds, if not, well, thousands of people at this thing. So we went to the beach down in Vancouver about, uh, uh, lunchtime. And we went with these 60 or 70 lawn chairs and we went and we spiked them into the sand. Uh, and all the backs of them had our web address and, and information and it also said on there, complimentary of our company, have a nice relaxing uh, seating experience for the fireworks. Well, once again, I know it works because the next couple of days we got some calls flooding in, uh, quite a few actually. And again, I'd ask them at the end of the conversation, now how did you find out about our advertising? And they would say, well, we went to the fireworks festival and we sat on one of your comfy uh, free chairs and we actually took the chair home and we're using it in our yard. So there you go. The next way is putting brochures and mailboxes around existing clients. So for example, if I had some clients on a street, uh, I would go around to those mailboxes around and put more mailbox advertising in their mailbox to get more potential clients. Now this is an old fashioned way that the roofers used to do and they still do or anyone working in trades on homes. They will uh, get up on the roof, do their roofing or whatever, and then also send over one of the young guys or whoever to uh, go around and put brochures in the mailboxes for their roofing company and that to get more business. Makes sense. And finally, another one is vinyl lettering on a car. Oh, this one's important. Yeah, this one's important, that's for sure. Expensive wrap did not work from us from a sign shop. That didn't work at all. Like you can spend about five to ten grand on a wrap journey, but uh, the full vinyl wrap on a car. But yeah, I never understood why the wrap didn't work. Well, I don't because it was really visually, uh, it was a real visual pop when you were driving down the road. So I could never figure out why a visual wrap didn't work, and but why your vinyl lettering did. It was a real mystery, and I never did figure it out. I'm thinking psychologically what it might be is the vinyl wrap shows uh, uh, cheapness, kind of like uh, like mom and pop or like uh, low-key, low-scale, you know, like where if you got a fleet of vehicles all wrapped up, people are going to think, well, you know, the guy's got big overhead. He's going to charge an arm and a leg for his service. And uh, maybe this guy was just a little bit of, uh, you know, vinyl text uh you know, very uh, humbly on his vehicle that, you know, maybe he's going to treat us good and really personal. He's not a big uh, corporate company with a big expense accounts and uh, large overhead, as I say. And maybe it'll just be cheaper and more uh, personable and that. I don't know, Journey. I just know that the wraps have never worked effectively. Okay, well, that wraps it up for the guerrilla advertising. It's important to warn everyone that guerrilla advertising has its pros and cons. The plus side, it's cheap and highly visible to the target market, and a lot of clients love the immediately available information that they don't have to look for. We received so many phone calls from excited moms thanking us for saving them time on trying to find music lessons for their kids. The minus side to guerrilla advertising is it takes up a lot of time and energy. Uh, The hours we spent driving around neighborhoods putting up posters. Also, 
By doing all this, it can make your company look very unprofessional. You can alienate potential customers who might see what you're doing as littering or just obnoxious or illegal. You could face also some bylaw fines. <laughs> and hey, Journey, we came close to that a couple times. We sure did. And also, I have to say, the seniors in the community did not like what we were doing. They were always ripping our posters down. So if you experience that while you're putting up posters, stop. Don't keep going. <laughs> I did feel, though, over time, most of our guerrilla advertising worked more than it didn't work. Yeah, you know, the only thing I never did, Journey, is for guerrilla advertising is actually rent a gorilla suit and wave at the side of the road. I mean, it came down to almost a chicken suit or a gorilla suit, didn't it? Like I remember talking about that, too. Now, for you folks at home, you know, I'm just toying around. I know a gorilla is not in, like, gorilla. <laughs> but, you know, you should, you should know my humor by now. It's pretty cheesy. Time for a coffee break. Hey, Journey, I got an idea. What's that? Let's talk about some naked people. Oh, we got so many stories about naked people. What is it with us? We're like a magnet for naked people. I don't know, but I love talking about naked people. I, you know, and if you ever want to get people's attention, you could be talking about astrophysics or God knows what, and blah, 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 and people are not asleep, and you want to bring them back? Say, naked people. I saw some. I have too. <laughs> and then that'll get people's attention. Just like that. Oh, yeah. In fact, we should have called our podcast Naked People Podcast. I know, right? And then not even, like, not even have anything to do with nakedness or anything like that. Just like, we could have called it the Naked Podcaster. Like, you'd get a bunch of hits. Like, you'd get a shitload of them. But And we could have had pictures with, you know, that big black bar that they have for censorship? <laughs> We could, like, put black <laughs> bars over their, their oh, eyes or their faces yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. And just show the pictures. So any of you kids out there that are thinking about doing a podcast, well, I shouldn't say kids. <laughs> Let's play, play it safe here. Any of you adults out there that are toying around with the idea of doing a podcast and have no idea about it or a name for a podcast, you can, I'll sell it to you for free. You can take that one. It's called thenakedpodcaster.com. I guarantee you some... Some uh, traffic your way. Do you remember in Vancouver living there and there was that lady that rode her bicycle with no clothes on? Like no top? Oh yeah, I remember her. Like not even scared. Like bold as brass, just riding along the road. Like she had clothes uh, down south, of course, but like up top, she was out on patrol. Did you ever find out why she was doing that? I never heard the end of the story. I just heard she was around town. I just seen her around town. I never stopped to talk to her, really. You actually saw her? I seen her. I had, she was going down the road. Like nobody's business. <laughs> hey, um, do you remember that naked hiker that was in the news that one time? Oh, yeah. They didn't know if he was a Sasquatch or not or what. You know, like, hey, it was a real hairy bugger. Yeah, just hiking around the trails in Poco with no clothes on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Families were bumping into him. Yeah, I know, he was just poking his way around Poco. Really, he was. And oh, I heard he was a real hairy bugger and that. But yeah, he didn't wear any clothes and all. And so there was basically the, you know, the, nude, the nude hiker on the trails around Vancouver Coquitlam. Then there was uh, Topsy the Topless. She was out on her bike a lot. Then there was that strange guy that used to run around Coquitlam um, in his Speedos, and he had um, weights that he was lifting as he was running. Oh, yeah, that was great. You actually talked to him once. Oh, yeah, he said, he was, this guy, like, I used to go to the gym when I used to like to keep in shape. Now I don't do anything. But back then when I went to the gym, there was all these really muscle guys there, of course, and they would always talk around at the weights and say, have you seen that old, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger European guy? He doesn't come to the gym, but he, he's got weights on his ankles and his arms, and he's got dumbbells in his hands, and he's, he looks like Schwarzenegger all, t you know, tanned up. He walks up and down the hills around Vancouver and Coquitlam, and, and in minus five in the snow, he was out there walking around, and, and I actually got a chance journey to meet him. 
Yeah, you told me. Oh, I did I? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I was in the Coquitlam Mall parking lot putting something in my trunk, some shopping in my shopping bags in the trunk of the car, and he was taking a shortcut through the parking lot, and I could hear this clunking and dragging coming towards me, and I look, and, and here's old Schwartzy there coming at me, and I... I was always curious about this guy because the guys at the gym were talking about him all the time. So I thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to stop him politely here and talk to him so that when I go to the gym, I can tell these uh, roid monkeys back at the gym about him because they were always talking about him, eh? So I said, hey, good afternoon to you. And he says, hello, Ivy, I'm going for my exercise. I walk up the hill, I walk down there, and I go around here and there. And he... Nice enough guy, too. Really, hell of a nice guy, really. Um, but, yeah, talk about dedication. And I said, do you do this every day? And he goes, every day. I, I walk up the hills. I walk down. I have strapped myself with weights. And I stay away from my wife. She, I see her in the morning. I kiss her goodbye. I say, I see you tonight. And then I go home at night. I see her. But not in the day. I had enough of her. Well, I... I fucking laughed my ass off, Journey. But... <laughs> Remember that time we saw him on Christmas Day going up the hill? Oh, I know. And it like, was snowing. Like, and he didn't have a shirt on. He was just wearing these little shorts oh, and I running know. shoes. And that was it. I know. And I love that pair of Speedos he wore that were kind of uh, reminiscent of Richard Simmons. You know, like Richard Simmons wore the striped baggy shorts? <laughs> yeah. Kind of yeah. baggy yeah. kind of shorts. But this guy, he bald as brass had the striped speedos on and nothing else just hiking boots and the striped speedo and wear nothing but muscles really and yeah he was hiking uphill with the, the weight bands on his ankles and his wrists dumbbells in his hands christmas day snowing at about minus five no shirt on conditional training he actually said that to me in the parking lot too he said if we do this back home a lot of us guys, we, we don't use gym. We go out in cold, no clothes, lay in the snow, and we walk up downhill, weighted down, keep in shape. So there you go. I mean. Well, you know, for people in Kamloops, we do have that one naked guy that hangs out on the beach underneath the bridge. <laughs> now that, oh, I love that. That's like. Speaking of naked guys. Oh, yeah. And, and he does it the old European way, too, you know, like. And I'm not even saying European now. I'm getting fancy. He's doing it the old European way. He's laying out there with the little Speedo on, and he's got the tin foil reflecting the, the sun rays. Like, he's a professional sun tanner, this guy. And he, he lays and lopes around on the beaches in Kamloops, this guy. And, uh, wow. That's pretty cool. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not going to do it. No, no, me either. I'm not going to ever do that. No. Well. Not outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's cut this bullshit journey, okay? And uh, that's, the co that's the coffee break. Adios. And that's, that's the, end the end of, of the coffee, coffee break. break. And every episode of the Micro Business Renegade podcast has a story about... The customer. <laughs> customer story three. Ran out of frown town. Straight out the gate, I have a crazy tale about a potential customer who went the extra mile. In our early years, Journey and I did a lot of guerrilla advertising. Usually, our brave efforts were rewarded with new customers. However, one sunny day in Langley, British Columbia, Canada, proved otherwise. Journey and I set out bright and early on a lovely summer day to Langley, B.C., armed with our secret weapon of choice, advertising brochures. This guerrilla marketing tactic involved moving stealthily through parking lots and placing our advertising brochures under vehicle windshield wipers without public detection. Well, <laughs> Almost a perfect crime. Journey and I crawled our car into the Walnut Grove Community Rec Center as I whispered, Wow, Journey, look at the hundreds of vehicles here. We have hit the mother load. 
We slipped our car into a vacant parking stall and loaded ourselves with brochures and begun to slink and duck our way through the rows of cars like true parking lot ninjas. Like always, everything was progressing along like protocol. Our stacks of brochures were diminishing rapidly and the rows of vehicles looked like white sailboats with brochures fluttering in the summer breeze. I was heading back to our car to grab another stack of ads when a booming voice yelled, I've been watching you. I looked up to see a big smug-faced man leaning against an old rusted out minivan. I replied, What a beautiful day. May I interest you in some music lessons, sir? (laughs) He chuckled and said, I might have been interested in some singing lessons, but your advertising approach really strikes a sour note with me. So no sale here, man. I then politely asked the gentleman why our advertising had turned him off of music lessons. He said that we were committing a criminal act by littering the ground of Walnut Grove. Sir, it is only littering if the vehicle owner throws our brochure on the ground. The choice is in your hands, sir, I said with conviction. His big demeanor started to turn red, and he threatened to call the police if I tried to place our brochure on his minivan. I calmly stated that we would not go near his vehicle as per his request. He then proceeded to ask me if I had permission from the Langley Rec Center to canvass the parking lot. Sensing that this conversation was rapidly taking a nosedive, I lied out of desperation and panic and said, Yes, of course we have permission to advertise here. He then barked back skeptically and said, Oh yeah? Who gave you permission? What's their name? I then threw my mind in high gear and formulated another quick lie. Uh, Nancy at the front desk of the rack center. You know, the one with the long brown hair and glasses. He looked down at me suspiciously and said, All right, I'm going into that rack center to ask Nancy if she knows about all this and if she doesn't, I will find you and beat you into the ground. I said, as calmly as possible, "Uh, No problem, sir. I will proceed on with my advertising and have a nice day. He then turned on his heel and charged towards the front doors of the rec center. I also turned on my heel and ran towards my car to make a quick getaway before he found out about no front desk, no Nancy with the long brown hair and glasses, and most important, no permission. By now, my calm, cool, and collected ninja parking lot stealthing had turned into a mad panic 100-meter dash. Journey could see me running towards her. Before she could ask me what was wrong, I yelled at her, Get in the car now! I cranked on my engine and started to back out of my parking stall when in my rearview mirror I could see the huge man yelling and running towards us with a beet red face. We squealed our tires around the corner. He jumped into his old rusted minivan, put the pedal to the metal, and tried to head us off at the pass to block the entrance of the rec center with his minivan. Luckily, we got there first and slipped out the only exit available. But not without a chase. Forget about calling the police. This guy was going to do his own citizen's arrest. By now, Journey and I were speeding along Walnut Grove Avenue at breakneck speed. Journey then looked over at me. I was putting a death grip on the steering wheel, with my eyes wide open, not even blinking. What the hell is going on, Cash? She yelled at me. I explained to Journey the whole scenario between the swerving and honking of traffic. I quickly glanced in my rearview mirror only to see a lopsided minivan kicking up dust behind us. It was the big Langley man hot on our trail. He was shaking his big ham hock of a fist out the window and yelling, Come back here! You're dead! (laughs) I yelled to Journey, We gotta shake this big ape before he kills us. He's so huge that his minivan is all sunk over to one side. Now his van was on our bumper, laying one huge long horn honk, mad as a hornet at a Canada Day picnic. The traffic light ahead was turning amber, 
I punched the gas pedal through the floorboard and shot through the red light, leaving the enraged lunatic in the dust. As we hit the Langley border exit, we could hear his horn and booming voice fading away. I then looked over at Journey. She was paralyzed with fear. Gazing forward, she said, Cash, we literally just got ran out of town. I said, Yeah, and I'm not going back. And the good news in this bad news story is, in the end, we did receive some music lesson clients in Langley, and <laughs> I did go back there after a while once the smoke and dust and anger had cleared. And the moral of this story, podcast listeners, when faced with physical opposition to grill advertising, it's better to back down than to pursue your marketing plan. Use the dead of night as a cover. <laughs> So, you good folks at home, we'll keep you posted on the success of this podcast. But more importantly, stay tuned for future podcasts to help you succeed with your micro business. I'm Journey. And I'm Cash. Hey, remember, reach for the sky. But don't fly too close to the sun. Calling all people in podcast land, come visit us on our Facebook page, the Microbusiness Renegade Podcast, or visit us at our website, microbusinessrenegade.com, or send us an email at microbusinessrenegade at gmail.com, or visit us on Stitcher, Google Plus, iTunes, the whole shebang. Talk to you soon. Hey, are you listening? The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Micro Business Renegade podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Micro Business Renegade podcast and its owners. The Micro Business Renegade podcast is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. The primary purpose of this podcast series is to educate and inform. This podcast series does not constitute micro or small business or any other professional advice or services. This podcast is available for private non-commercial use only. Advertising which is incorporated into, placed in association with, or targeted towards the content of this podcast without the express approval and knowledge of the Micro Business Renegade podcast site developers is forbidden. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of this Micro Business Renegade podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website, computer, or playing device.